We're so excited to have two folks here. I think this is, we haven't done too many four-person shows before. So today is everybody's lucky day. We have Benji Sarlin and Leanne Caldwell, who are political reporters at NBC, who have a great new piece they want to talk about with us. So thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, Margie. We're glad to be here. So the focus of your piece, uh, tell us a little bit about it. What I've learned is that it's it's essentially walking us through uh, the Republican Party's trials and tribulations and is looking ahead to what on earth is going to happen to this party in the coming months and years. That's right. We're trying to figure out in this age of Trump where you just had a primary where Donald Trump really shattered for a lot of Republicans their image of their own party. Uh, you know, a lot of people didn't think it was possible for someone like him to win the nomination. And on a whole lot of core issues that the party thought it stood for, he disagrees with them. You know, he's very... Uh, skeptical of trade. He's very tough on immigration. Uh, he's in so many different ways kind of uh, goes against this image that the party has had of itself. So looking ahead, whether he wins or loses, um, the party is going to have to grapple with that. So we tried to talk to people, uh, Republican thought leaders from every wing of the party, from hardcore pro-Trump to what you'd call the definition of establishment and the big donor class, and ask them, what does this mean to you? What have you learned from Trump winning? And where does the party have to go from here? And we got just a fascinating range of answers. On this show, we talked a lot, you know, every week during the primary, we were looking at polls uh, about what, what are Republican voters thinking, who's up, who's down. And of course, this was such a huge Republican primary field uh, that there is this argument out there that the reason why the Republican Party is the Trump Party, at least temporarily, uh, is because the field was so big and that it's not actually the Trump Party, that he just kind of got lucky of this weird fluke that we had so many people running. And, you know, he never pulled in a majority of Republicans in the polls. I mean, how much do people t focus on the way the primary polling and the primary results shook out to inform how they think about the role that a Trump or Trump wing might play in the future of the party? <laughs> I think that what the interesting thing about all of this is that there's still not consensus. There's still a lot of disagreement. Uh, Republicans from all ends of the spectrum um, think think differently about what happened. They think differently about where the party needs to go. And I think that's going to be the main tension point moving forward is that they're going to have to figure out what the party means, what the party symbolizes. Do they bring in some of the Trump element into the party or do they try to shut it down? I mean, we all know that the Republican Party has been going through um, some pains over the past few years. We saw the rise of the Tea Party in 2010. Um, so there was that struggle, which is partially populist um, in, in nature, but it was also a very activist base. And now they have this other segment of populism that has felt ignored for so long, especially in politics, that finally has a voice in Donald Trump. And the party is really going to have to figure out what they do with that. Um, and I will say that through the past months of reporting on this, I have seen a slight evolution in, in Republicans' um, thinking in the sense that at the beginning of this, people thought that Trump was a one-time phenomenon. And now you see some of these same Republicans, even these never-Trumpers, who are acknowledging that there might be something there that that the party needs to consider moving forward if Trump is wins the presidency or not. So tell us a little bit Benji, what were some of the highlights of the folks that you spoke to? What were some fun moments, key insights from some of the folks you spoke to? Well, one thing that's interesting is that we started out asking everyone, what's your ideal Republican Party? Uh, when you think of why you're a Republican or why you're attracted to the Republican Party, what stands out? It sounds like a good focus group icebreaker, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Is, is that how you start your focus group? <laughs> Normally, I just ask, like, what makes you happy in a given day and what are the things that keep you up at night? Right. I keep it real broad. Right. That's, well, that's after, the ice break, after the icebreaker, after the icebreaker, then into the actual, <laughs> <laughs> into the actual. So piece. the one thing we found is that pretty much no matter who you were talking to across the spectrum, uh, people used a lot of similar words to describe their ideal Republican Party. It was, you know, uh, the party of limited government and individual responsibility. Some people mentioned the family. Some people mentioned national security. Um, where things broke down is 
deciding what policies uh, actually fulfill those ideals. And that's where things started getting a little dicey. And also which wings of the party were the most authentic expression of those ideals? Who was the, the core of the party? So depending on who you talk to, you got some really interesting answers. Um, one of my favorite interviews was with uh, Carl Palladino, who uh, ran for governor in New York in 2010. He's kind of he a proto He was proto like Trump. kind of, right, he was like the early, ver- right, early version of Trump in yeah, some ways. Yeah, he, he's a wealthy, very kind of foul-mouthed, tough-talking businessman from uh, from Buffalo. Crazy emails being forwarded, all yeah, of them. He, he became, it's a lot like Trump. So when he started running for governor, he was, there was a scandal, if you'd call it that, because he didn't really consider it as such, where he had been sending out emails to people with just horrible racism and pornographic stuff to like this list serve that included reporters and you know influential people in politics like you're cra- literally your crazy uncle yes and then he became <laughs> the nominee anyway and lost in a landslide in the general election and now he's the chair of trump's new york campaign which trump takes very seriously so when we're talking to carl paladino he has a very clear view of the party which is that look the party is people like me you know whether Crazy emails for everybody. A crazy email on every laptop. (laughs) Well, the way he would put it is that that's a mere side effect of being, you know, a working kind of guy. He's a rich guy, but he works in, you know, industries like construction, a kind of blue collar attitude. He's from an area of New York that's been very economically depressed, that feels very politically abandoned, that, you know, that feels like neither party has really been talking about people in, say, a non-swing state where they've had a lot of industry leave and it's they're going for a very tough transition period. They don't really feel culturally connected to either party's elites. Uh, and his argument is that, look, this is a long time coming. He said the party of George W. Bush was never my party. You know, when George W. Bush says, I'm worried the Republican Party is going to die, he says, like, I hope your Republican Party dies. Uh, so you get on one end of the spectrum interesting people like him. On the other end of the spectrum, there's people who the Republican Party is very much a set of strict philosophical principles. You know, to them, it's uh, a very specific set of ideals of limited government for, you know, the, for the sake of principled limited government. That it's because, uh, you know, on a on a moral level, we should have the have these kinds of policies uh, that, that animates their support. So we talked to someone like uh, Tony Fratto, for example, who's kind of like a, used to be in the Bush administration. He's a, he's a lobbyist. Um, His argument was you just can't have those people in the same party as me uh, because you just end up with an incoherent. The reason I'm here is because I believe in free trade and I believe in fiscal conservatism, that we need to get the long term deficit under control. and It's going to mean some painful cuts. And if you invite people like Carl Palladino into the party who are completely 100 percent opposed to those things, we're never going to get anything done because we'll have a party that doesn't make any sense. So we we definitely got a really wide range of uh, responses from people as to why they're a Republican and what that means going forward. One of the things that we've found uh, and talked about in polls on this show is uh, I think it was a study that was done uh, maybe a year or so ago where voters were asked, do you support or oppose a particular policy? And it was something around Obamacare, like supporting uh, some kind of or it was like a like they it was single payer, but like they worded it in a different way. And then they asked voters. It, uh, if Donald Trump supports uh, this policy, blah, 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 do you support it? And found that this huge number of Republicans said that they would support single payer if Donald Trump came out in support of single payer, which really raises the question, are people motivated politically to support a person? Are they there to support a principle? Are they there to support a policy? Uh, and what's funny is in focus group after focus group, I will hear people who will say, I think of Republicans as being very my way or the highway. There's only one way to do things and my way is the right way. And what's ironic is that there is no one right way within the Republican Party. If you went into the cycle assuming that at least like limited government might be kind of the the core of this apple uh that that even that has been sort of debunked because i don't think donald trump ever even uses the phrase limited government i mean I, we could go back through transcripts I, I i don't think i've ever heard him use the phrase limited government um which i think really raises this fascinating question then of what how do you even define republican and and if trump loses the presidency as the polls suggest he's likely to what happens to the word republican yeah, I think that it's 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 kind of the question that Republicans in the country are contemplating, right? I mean, so there was is one philosophy that some Republicans think that look, this is this is Donald Trump. No one else can replicate what he's doing. He's the mess um people like the messenger 
They don't care as much about the message. And, um, and that's what's throwing everyone for a loop. And that's why when we were talking to all these Republicans for this piece, when we sent them these questionnaires and we interviewed some on video, um, a lot of that came out in the sense that that people were identifying what it meant for them to be a Republican, but then Trump totally flipped that concept upside down. And some people, like Katie Packer, for example, she led um, our principles PAC, um, leader of the Never Trump movement uh, during the primaries. And, and she was really emotional and really kind of distraught in how she was describing her her belief as being a Republican and what it means to her and how it was just like the shining beacon on the hill is how she described it. And then, um, but then by the end of the questionnaire, when we asked where the party moves from here, you know, she was talking about, we have to, we have to reach out to these voters that Trump is, is appealing to, to try to understand them try to figure out what they need and how they fit into the Republican Party because she believes that they are Republicans and that they can fit to the, into the Republican Party. So it wasn't a complete dismissal of Trump. And it was, um, even though she she abhors him, really, uh, she was more accepting of, of what he's done to appeal to a segment of society that has been not loyal to the Republican Party. Uh, yeah. Before, yeah, I mean, I guess this is a challenge for Republicans. Trump has a, his base very enthusiastic, and you see a polling narrative revolving around the fact that he has voters who are not represented by the polls. Tabling aside, that people who think the polls are skewed deliberately, but that they're just not represented. They don't want to admit that they're Trump supporters. They're not registered voters yet, and that's underrepresenting his support. Um, by, and that's usually not where you see Republicans going by saying that their voters are at, un, us, are less likely to come out than usual, that usually it's Democrats who have a turnout issue. Um, and then you compare that to more establishment Republicans who don't generate that kind of enthusiasm, but have the establishment support of their party, whether you think of Jeb Bush or Mitt Romney. I don't know how you find, and maybe you just don't know until that person, he or she arrives, somebody who is enthusi- generates enthusiasm, but also appeals to the main stream did did your uh interview subjects speak to that or have some ideas about that so the people we were talking to had perhaps the most uh kind of clear concentrated formula for trying to fix that problem were these so-called reform conservatives so this is a wing of the party it's kind of a a handful of uh well-known intellectuals you might know for example ross douthit at the new york times is a big member, but there's people who are sort of associated with him. We talked to like, uh, Henry Olson, uh, who's a, who's a think tank fellow and, uh, some others like David Frum, uh, the former, uh, George W. Bush speechwriter who's, who's talked about some of these things. Their argument is, look, we do have to understand why Trump was able to fire these people up. And we think the answer is economic policies. Our, concern, according to them, is that the party no longer really speaks to working people because the policies are mostly kind of a bummer for if you're one of those Trump voters. It's we're going to Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Tax, which only affects the top like zero point two percent of households. We're gonna cut capital gains taxes, which don't really apply to you. We're gonna cut the top tax rate, which doesn't apply to you. And in exchange we'll entitlements, cut entitlements. Right. We'll also privatize Medicare and cut the benefits over time and deny you a Medicaid expansion in your state if you're hurting. Which which probably does apply to you. (laughs) Right. Which there's no and in addition, we're really for these immigrants that you're bringing in immigrants that may be competing with you for jobs or you may be uncomfortable with for a variety of reasons. You know, it, it, the idea is that there's just nothing that they're being offered. So the answer in their eyes is we obviously have to cut out the racism, the bigotry, the misogyny, things like the Muslim ban from Trump's platform. But maybe if we give a little on having concrete, deliverable, you know, g- benefits for some of his voters, you know, that aren't just things aimed at the very top, maybe they'll come back. But here's the problem here. You mentioned that excitement issue, right? They're working on the assumption that the thing bringing out these people to Trump rallies is that they really don't like Social Security cuts. And, you know, I've talked to these Trump voters. they really don't like immigrants. Right. I've talked to these Trump voters. And sometimes that really is a part of it. I was just talking the other day at a rally to someone telling me the reason I'm supporting Trump is that I'm on Social Security. It's my livelihood. And he's the only Republican who gets that, that that's important. But what if 
maybe a lot of those voters are coming out because they like hearing Trump saying incredibly offensive things about Muslims, about Mexicans, uh, about the Black Lives Matter movement. And if you try to cut that out, they're just not going to care or listen to you. And that that's a serious problem that some of the critics of that movement raise in interviews with us, too. And did anybody speak to that? Because that seems like such a, pardon the phrase, an elephant in the room here, because you see so, you know, all the research that we've shown, that we've seen, that we've been talking to, the academic research, anecdotal research shows that uh, race and views toward race play such a large role role in views toward Trump that more than you see in other Republican candidates. I mean, did you find uh, folks, Leanne, who were speaking to that, who were aware of that, trying to figure out what to do about that? Because it's not simply about the minimum wage or Social Security or Medicaid. It, it, It really seems to go deeper than that. Yeah, and a lot of our interviewees did address that, but most of them were saying, "Look, that's not a that that stuff does not have a place in the Republican Party," and people did not want the party to move in that more in that direction to embrace those those um, that rhetoric that that Trump kind of espouses and symbolizes. Um, but on the other hand, there were some Republicans that we talked to who do believe that, look, comprehensive immigration reform is not the thing that the party needs to believe in. This is not what a lot of the peop- of people in the party want. Um, and, and so the autopsy, you know, there were two, there were two, um, schools of thought here. Like some of them were all about the autopsy, the Republican autopsy after 2012 election and saying, look, we still need to do something about immigration and outreach to Hispanics. And then there was the other, there was a lot more um, belief in this school of thought than I anticipated was that, you know, comprehensive immigration reform is not the thing that the party needs. Uh, We need to break it up. We do need to be stronger on immigration. Um, This is, um, and, and eventually, uh, we'll get there, but it's um, it, that was more surprising to me that um, there were these kind of establishment type Republicans who were acknowledging that um, the last two efforts in Congress on immigration reform is not the route that the party needs to take. So one of the things that I've uh, I, I recall at the beginning of this election cycle thinking this was going to be a fascinating inside the party war for the for the the heart and soul of the party and it was going to be primarily between two camps that we've talked about a lot on our show before. So on the one hand you have that autopsy camp, right? The and and you know we just did an interview with Ron Brownstein um recently where you know he talks about the changing demographics of America and the GOP needs to do things to make sure that they are well positioned uh to not get left behind given these changing demographics. On the other hand, you've had the sort of uh, the Sean Trendy missing white voters theory that there were all of these voters who stayed home, sort of unenthused by Mitt Romney, and therefore we needed a new strategy to bring them out. And this was something that on the campaign trail, Ted Cruz talked about a lot, saying there are all of these voters that are conservatives, but they stay home because they don't like it when we nominate nominate these mushy moderates. So it's time for a true Tea Party, Freedom Caucus, constitution-loving conservative And that's what's going to turn out these missing voters. And, of course, Trump comes along and kind of blows that (laughs) up, right, because he's now this Mm -hmm. third way. He's going to go find those voters who stayed home, but he realizes that they're not constitution-loving, you know, let's do everything we can to protect liberty type folks. They are get your government hands off my Medicare type people mixed with I don't like to press one for English people. Um, And so, you know, Trump finds this new path within the party to me, though, it seems that 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 initial battle of do we need to become more conservative or do we need to become more moderate is still not resolved out of this. So what happens next? I mean, when you were talking to folks, how do they view the potential paths forward for the GOP? What might the Republican Party then look like? Or at least what will the factions be um, after November? So the biggest difference we heard in factions was – who has to make a sacrifice for you to bring in people who aren't voting for you currently? Now, if you're on the side that thinks that Trump voters are really people who need to be Republicans and we really de- do need those, quote unquote, missing whites turning out and fired up, uh, then you think that the donor class is going to have to make some very difficult sacrifices. You're going to have to get more populist, maybe on immigration, maybe on trade, uh, definitely on things like taxes and benefits. And, you know, the Chamber of Commerce might not like a lot of these things and the Koch brothers might not like a lot of these things, either for ideological reasons or for their bottom line reasons. But, you know, that's just going to be the the 
that's what it takes to fire those people up without ending up with like a crate, you know, a really crazy candidate championing it instead of you. Then there's the side that is saying, well, look, uh, someone does need to make a sacrifice here, but it's going to be that kind of Trump wing of the party, um, whether it's the kind of non-ideological uh, kind of cultural conservatives that Trump has riled up or whether it's the more ideological populist Tea Party conservatives that Ted Cruz has riled up who are, you know, have a very specific rigid ideological view, but it still is a minority view within the country of, you know, this kind of very tight uh, religious conservatism that's very doctrinaire. Uh, you know, th this this side says that, uh, OK, you're going to have to make the sacrifice. We're going to be appealing to kind of upscale suburban, uh, urban kind of this changing America of people who are who are younger, who are strivers, uh, who, who who see the Republican Party as kind of out of touch and intolerant. And the way we're going to win is by basically eating into the Obama coalition. Uh, you know, we'll have to try to keep some of those Trump voters with us, but the priority to get to 51% is to, or to 50% plus one, is to eat into those Democratic groups by making yourself look a little more safe for them. That to me was the biggest divide. And there were gradations, there were debates on how you get these people and how much you have to sacrifice, uh, and how much you're able to appeal to both at the same time. But to me, it's, mostly varying degrees of emphasis on those two paths, uh, out outreach to Democratic core voters or firing up Republican core voters. And this, do, this is why I'm always, by the way, I, I'll confess my bias in here. If I had to pick which one of these wings I like the most, it's definite. I, I am emotionally with those reformicons. Yeah. I was joking when, when Benji came in, he was talking about, you know, oh, we talked to like Arthur Brooks and we talked to, we treat, you know, we were trying to talk to Ross Douthat and, you know, was naming all of, and Henry Olson was naming all these people. And I was like, oh, it's like my favorite boy band. <laughs> Not to like diminish it or sound silly, but I was like, oh yeah, I'm emotionally I'm with those folks because I feel like. They're kind of – I feel like of all of them, they're not taking the position necessarily that you have to choose between doubling down on the Trump folks or ejecting the Trump folks. But they're sort of trying to say, look, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? That if we're actually talking more about this middle class economics stuff, maybe we hang on to these Trump folks. You know, we we try to purge some of the, the racial animus and we, you know, we don't get into that stuff. Um, but we acknowledge that they do have a right to be anxious about their job going overseas or their job being stolen by somebody who comes here illegally and they, they do have a right to be anxious about the one percent getting richer and nothing coming down to them but at the same time you can do that in a way that also says look the government has thrown up barriers uh to you if you're african-american and the government has thrown up barriers to you if you're a millennial and we need to do the following things to win over these growing groups as well so maybe i just like uh the reformer cons because i feel like they sort of Try to make more people happy. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. And I think that, you know, the Reformacons have been talking about a version of this for a while, right? Indeed. <laughs> um, yeah, but they, they do it at a very intellectual level. They don't get, a, you know, they're not making very simplistic solution, giving simplistic solutions for complex arguments, right? Like they, their, their solutions are still complex. They're very, you know, build a wall I, is yes. a heck of a lot easier to wrap your mind around than like a really interesting article written in national affairs that explains different ways <laughs> you can do a child tax credit. <laughs> yeah, it's a Absolutely. Think tank these, are, Abs these are people who are very comfortable, you know, they get a lot of attention in the mainstream press because they're very comfortable kind of talking to, you know, intellectuals and reporter types and, you know, that that's more their circle. Right. And they're not attached to the political realities of actually winning votes or getting bills made or backing candidates. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, and, you know, on the flip side of that, there, then there's the, I found like a lot of like former Romney people were still kind of in the anti-populist space of this is not the, what the Republican party is. We need to kind of purge the party from this, this overly populist appeal and and move forward with what we believe in, which we think is the right is what Republicanism is. And um, and that's kind of like the donor class, as Benji was mentioning, and kind of this, um, you know, you, you call them elite class or whatever, but these intellectuals within the party and um, and. I don't personally, um, putting my two cents in, I don't see how that can really happen only because the Republican Party has been battling itself for the past few years anyway, and and that it, no faction has really won out. And so it's like 
is the party going to have to um, live together merrily with all these different factions? Then you have the social conservatives, then you have the populists, and then you have kind of the the donor corporate faction, and then you have the um, kind of neocons or people who are really interested in national security. Like basically, you're at, if you maintain this divided Republican Party that is one family, then you're almost adding, then you have to add this Trump faction onto it, which makes it really, really complicated. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I'm glad I'm not Paul Ryan trying to have to figure out what to do next because it's going to be really intense. I want to almost, gosh, um, listeners, consider this a request. If you're somebody who's uh, very good at, say, data visualization, wants to code this up and, you know, your free time, I would love to see something where you have maybe just like a list of like eight or nine different checkboxes of things that people in this story have said, this is what you have to believe in order to be a Republican. You have to believe (laughs) that we need to limit government spending and deal with the debt. You have to believe that we need free trade. You have to believe that we need to curb immigration and protect our borders. You have to believe X, Y, and Z. And then every time you check a box for like, all right, this is the party I'm building. You have to believe at least a minimum of these things. Which of the groups like falls out of the pie chart? Like, how do you build the biggest possible pie chart out of checkboxes? Oh, man. Why are you giving us these great assignments? You should be our assignment editor. We, if you gave this three weeks ago, we would have been all over oh, this. No. I know. It's, 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 it's a great, great, great piece. poll. You could add that to your next survey, <laughs> yeah, NBC get, Survey Monkey poll and see how voters and shake out. The data. Right. But, I but, bet you'd find a lot of Democrats in some of those boxes, too. Yeah. Yeah. But you see how you end up with this square, this circle problem. And, uh, you know, the problem with a lot of the Paul Ryan issues that have been raised, uh, you know, know, by members of the party is that um, this is a tough thing, but a lot of the kind of established Republican agenda just and really some of the populist agenda is just objectively not very popular right now when you poll it. Um, As much as this uh, anti-immigrant wing is extremely important within the party and it's, you know, it's very hard to win elections without them voting Republican and Trump's really tapped into them. They're not even a majority of the Republican Party. We had no, exit polls yes, in exactly. every, in all these states, and in, with the exception of I think just one or two, a majority of the primary voters, these are the most fired up loyal Republican voters, favored a path to legal status or yes. citizenship for undocumented immigrants. And Trump did pretty well with those voters, right? We did a poll in February, an NBC poll <laughs> of just Trump supporters that found 44% of them favored a path to legal status. Yep. So you have this situation here where you're being sort of torn, you know, towards positions that aren't necessarily that popular overall. But here's the thing. The establishment side doesn't get to brag about this either. Because if you ask people, do you favor raising taxes on the 1%? Yep. Or if you ask them, how do you feel about, say, you know, changing the formula for Social Security to reduce benefits over time? They're not happy with it. Those are extremely unpopular positions, just objectively. That's, so a lot of the problem is that both sides have some baggage that is just not it, – it's a tough sell for the general electorate. And I think it, it means that neither of them has a lot of has – a, has a huge leg to stand on to say we would be winning all over the place if just you listened to me. You know. Well, so that's another question. Did anybody speak to what the party could have done operationally? Any – did anyone point the finger at somebody or say we should have stopped Trump or we should have forced all the other candidates to get out or we should have just tried to kick him out at the convention or we should have you know, done X, Y, and Z to stop this from happening? We should have all of our candidates now in the Senate that's so – clearly up for grabs, say that they don't support Trump to encourage more split ticket voting in a very clear way as opposed to a more sort of muted way. Did anybody speak to any of that? Not really. I mean, um, that's nothing that we highlighted in the piece anyway. There were, and I, I'm not remembering off the top of my head because we didn't highlight it, but there were a couple of people who did talk about the process and how, you know, the process needs to change and, and that there were problems and that's how we ended up with Trump. But most people have kind of moved beyond that that we talked to. And maybe it was because that's that wasn't where we were questioning. We were more forward looking um, than backward looking. So, so we didn't really get into that, but I do anticipate, um, you know, depending upon the outcome or maybe despite the outcome on November 8th, that that's probably going to be a huge question. And it could be a, a circling firing circle. What's that? 
phrase, uh, circling fire squad or whatever, um, where there's going to be a lot of blame going around and a lot of questions asked. Um, um, but for this piece, we were mostly forward looking. Uh, and on that note, I could tell you one thing that might connect to this a little, which is that several people we talked to when we asked about the future of the party seem to indicate that whatever comes next, uh, whoever wins the nomination the next time, whoever leads the party kind of needs to be someone untainted by these past debates as sort of the way Barack Obama, you know, defeated Hillary Clinton in 2008 as someone who was kind of new and removed from these. So the big thing people brought up was look at this great freshman class we have who have been kind of quiet during this whole presidential cycle. Uh, some people really liked Tom Cotton. Some people really like Cory Gardner in Colorado. Uh, some people um, mentioned Joni Ernst in Iowa. You know, it's maybe we need to experiment with some new faces, see what they have to say. Maybe they can move past some of these debates by just being a little more charismatic, by being genera- generationally removed from kind of the older, angriest segments or the most entrenched institutional policy segments. Uh, it, it'll be kind of interesting to see uh, who, who emerges from that group as potentially a new leader. Well, so my, my last question for both of you, and, and I, Margie may have more, but my final question then is, I get asked a lot, can the party survive as a party? Or are we headed for an inevitable splitting up? You know, if you look at, we were talking earlier, Benji, about, you know, over in Europe, you've now got the National Front, which is separate from, you know, Sarkozy's party and the the UMP. Um, You know, you've got these sort of further right, populist, anti-immigrant parties that have emerged in Europe um, and have really kind of eaten the lunch of the more centrist parties and are now either running parliaments or earning seats in the European parliament. I mean, really, really taking a much bigger role. Whenever I get asked this, I always say, well, you know, structurally here in the U.S., our constitution makes it really hard for third parties just generally. We're not a parliamentary system. So, you know, it probably is going to settle down into a right party and a left party. And But I, I really am, you know, if if all of these folks can't all fit into the same party and it does rupture, I mean, is there a possibility that we get to four years from now and there's a Hillary Clinton running for reelection as the Democrat and you have two right-ish leaning parties each trying to fight each other for supremacy, like a, a conservative party led by a Ben Sass or something like that or versus, you know, a, a, a Trumpier rump whatever's left of the GOP? <laughs> Um, no one really went that far. I mean, one, John Fury, a uh, Republican strategist, he, he said it really poignantly though. And, um, which kind of struck me still, even though I kind of figured it intellectually, but he said the party of George Bush is over. And, um, you know, he wasn't saying that there's going to be a party divide, party divide, um, at all, but he was saying there is a going to be a new Republican Party moving forward, and it is not going to be the party of Ronald Reagan and George Bush. Um, and I thought that was really intense in the sense that until Donald Trump, everyone was trying, every Republican was trying to out Reagan the next. And now we don't have that. We have Donald Trump being Donald Trump and not caring at all about the history of the he Republican said really Party. Nasty things about Ronald Reagan in his book. <laughs> yeah, he has. I think that would and, be Tony Schwartz who said those nasty things. Oh, that's books. right. That's oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah. I mean, I'm I'm kind of with you in the sense that um, you know the uh, the American structure doesn't necessarily um, give way to a very strong third part or not an additional party. And I think that um, you know the respondents that we talked to didn't really go that deeply into that direction. But I will say, just speaking personally, uh, they did not bring it up a lot, though some indicated they were a little more concerned, not about a third party, but about the party maybe changing in a way that they can no longer be a member. Uh, We talked to Leon Wolf, for example, as an editor at Red State, really interesting kind of iconoclastic conservative writer. His opinion was that this change was already done. Like from now on, the party is probably going to be like one of those European far right parties you mentioned. And he's probably not going to be comfortable that he'll do his best to advocate for his issues. But he's not sure you know, he'll be able to really rejoin it except as an independent because he really thinks that's the direction it's going. So I do think it is possible that even though everyone might start with the best intention of trying to reunify the party and come back, and most of these never Trump people who are, you know, even some of them voting for Clinton are not going to be, they're not permanent Democrats necessarily. They'll probably be coming right back in after the election, assuming Trump loses. 
it doesn't mean you can avoid a split. Now, let's let's examine, for example, what would have happened if – and this is some suggestion I've heard from Republicans as like the key mistake that allowed Trump to win. What if at the very beginning when Trump started running, maybe right after he said those comments about McCain's war service, Reince Priebus had walked out, held a press conference and said, you know what? He's not a Republican. Even if he wins the nomination, we're not going to support him. We won't acknowledge him. It's, it, it, this is exactly what they did to Todd Akin in 2012. They just expelled him from the party. They said, we don't care what voters chose. This guy does not line up with us. Isn't it realistic that Trump might have well just said, well, the hell with you. I'm running as an independent. Mm-hmm. I'm self-financing. And now he'd be getting 20 percent in the polls and we'd all be tearing our hair out. There's no reason that can't happen again the next cycle. It's something that very much could happen. Um, if someone Trumpy, maybe even Trump himself, wins the nomination or the person who wins the nomination is someone that the Trump wing feels was forced on them. Say if this is something that we write about in our story. Say if the donor class decides we do need a purge of these kind of Trumpy people and not just the Trump people, the kind of populist wing of Ted Cruz. We're going to start financing just incredibly – powerful super PACs to take them all out all over the country. And we're not going to take any chances this time, this next you know nomination cycle. We're going to just try to like knock them out with $200 million right off the bat. What if their nomination gets off the finish line, but because of the way they won, that Trump wing says, you know what? We're not sticking with you. We're going to form, you know, the Trump forever party. Uh, these are things that can really happen. The MAGA party, the MAGA party. Exactly. The MAGA party. We're going to form the alt-right, the alt-conservative, the alt-right, alt-Republican party, you know? Well, I guess... As a Democrat, I feel better about thinking about the Trump wing being a third party spoiler than being (laughs) at 45 percent or 47 percent for the whole year. So we can just (laughs) on a daily basis think about all the horrible things he says, because I just find it's like I don't want Clinton to win by an asterisk because she's running against Trump. It's just too painful to listen to. All this negativity, but your piece sounded great. I, I'm really excited to to see more about it. I'm so glad you guys could come and talk to us about it. How can people find it? What's the URL for the piece if people want to watch it? And how can they find you guys on Twitter? Sure, it's uh, you can find it online starting um, or yeah, uh, www.mbcnews.com/slash Trump. And just to note, this is the third installment of the United States of Trump, the third and we think final. Um, so you can go back and, and read sections one and chapters one and two as well. And on Twitter, I'm at LA Caldwell DC, and I'm at Benji Sarlin at Benji Sarlin with a Y. <laughs> Great. Thanks, you guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Thank Enjoyed you. it. <laughs>